Hi, everyone. It's really my pleasure today to talk to you about a very hot topic in the luxury industry, which is really about luxury and digital. How luxury brands can leverage digital disruptions. So in this masterclass, I will develop different uh, points relating to this topic. Basically, I will start introducing the concept of digital disruptions, how much they disrupt potentially luxury brands. Uh, after that, we will revisit some of the specificities of luxury brand distribution and marketing uh, specificities to better understand what is specific to that industry and how they need to also consider the specificities when leveraging on digital. And later, we will move on to the different topics of what we call traditionally the digital revolution, be it e-commerce, mobile, social commerce, omni-retail, but also uh, social media, social media branding, uh, the concept of curated content, uh, user-generated content. And last but not least, I will talk about content, technology, uh, the new concept of IoT, the Internet of Things, and connected goods, which could be a very interesting directions in the future uh, for luxury brands as well. So let me start with explaining, introducing digital disruptions. I guess 10 years ago, if I had been talking to the same audience about digital relating to the luxury industry, most of the concepts that you can see here would not exist, or they would be just nascent concepts. What's amazing is how in less than 10 years, a new te terminology has developed around digital, and luxury brands are obviously part of these disruptions. Uh, we always talked about key opinion leaders, but nowadays we talked about bloggers, vloggers actually, even more than bloggers. Um, social media is relatively, is not a, a, such a new concept, but social commerce, brand social community, chat commerce are new concepts that start to spread around and we will see how they can affect luxury brands. IoT is even more recent. We will define IoT, talk about wearable devices and even connected goods, and even how virtual and augmented reality can be meaningful to this industry. Um, E-commerce has been, of course, here for a while. What is probably new today is the importance of marketplaces, the importance of direct sales, the fact that as some analysts said recently in a digital conference, direct to consumer is the new black and mobile is the language of choice. This is kind of disrupting, obviously, for a lot of luxury brands. In the same way, retail, traditional offline retail, as we all know, is challenged by e-commerce, by social commerce, by mobile commerce, and the new concept of omni-retail is becoming something that luxury brands cannot ignore anymore. The sharing economy is something very interesting. When we talk about the sharing economy, of course, we think about Uber, we think about Airbnb, but internet and the sharing economy have a lot of things in common. Internet facilitated the growth of the sharing economy and no one knows whether the luxury industry will be totally immune, even the fashion industry, to the sharing economy development. Some analysts even talk about Amazon, the Amazon effect when talking about digital disruptions. Obviously, like Google, like Facebook, like Alibaba, Tencent in China, um, Amazon is born from the digital revolution. And I will show you that the Amazon effect is not only a disruption for traditional offline fashion retailers in America, but probably a disruption for the entire community. Uh, last but not least, technology 
is starting to appear even in luxury stores. It starts to impact the luxury consumer experience. We start to see in different stores um, sensors, IB con technology, interactive fitting rooms, um, interactive tables. We start to see visual recognition being tested in a number of stores. And we talk more and more about the connected stores. So these are some of the new realities that 10 years ago were almost not present. Uh, there is even a new language. It's really funny for me to see, you know, a 10 years old kid in China and America. They speak a different language, but when it comes down to digital, when it comes down to the new digital language, they are all familiar with these logos, which are basically the new alphabet of digital. Uh, the Amazon effect is actually something quite interesting. Uh, the luxury fashion industry has been disrupted many, many years ago by fast fashion retailers such as Zara. We all remember luxury consumers starting to mix and match buying a luxury brand's top and a pair of trousers from Zara in the same day. Amazon is adding another layer of disruptions. We see more and more Amazon enlarging its grasp on, on retail. Obviously, it's not just about books and DVDs and, and, and CDs. It's about potentially everything. And it's also about fashion. And we start to see Amazon becoming a huge marketplace where more than 10 times the number of SKUs of Macy's are now present on Amazon Marketplace, not talking about Amazon developing its own private label, and not talking about Amazon starting to test traditional brick and mortar store, which is maybe a new disruptions for a lot of retailers. Amazon bringing together the online and the offline world. Talking about disruptions, you know, we have this news every day. We see a company like Snapchat raising something like $2 billion, just like that. We see a giant, another internet giant like Microsoft acquiring LinkedIn for $26 billion. I mean, even for big luxury companies, groups, conglomerates, such as LVMH, such as Richemont, here, the size of this transaction by itself is a kind of disruption and the power that these transactions, that these alliances are obviously going to give to these companies. Um, Alibaba in China is another phenomenon. Uh, Alibaba can be threatened by certain luxury brands to be taken to court because obviously in the past at least they were involved maybe in some kind of fitting. But Alibaba has the power to buy luxury brands. Alibaba has the power to buy luxury e-tailers and impose itself also as an actor in this industry, whether this actor is welcome or not. The sharing economy is a concept that I am looking at very closely. Behind, you know, the business models of the no stock and the sharing economy business model of Uber, Airbnb, even Alibaba, we also have an interesting question. Can internet and, you know, the, the fact that internet creates easy connections between buyers and sellers, can it also be responsible for the progression of the sharing economy in the fashion watch jewelry industry. I think it's interesting to remember, and you can see it on these slides, a few fundamental principles that govern the sharing economy. The future of consumption probably will be not only ownership, but also access. For a lot of millennium consumers who have a strong purchasing power, ownership is not the end of it. Accessing luxury, accessing luxury products, accessing a luxury lifestyle can sometimes be more relevant than ownership. And in fact, if you think of it, for items that we use only once in a while, ownership 
is not necessarily the most cost effective, neither the most convenient way of consumption. We all have apartments that tend to be smaller and smaller and the, the size of our closet is sometimes not enough to store all our belongings. What is interesting, again, is that, you know, the sharing economy was potentially always there. The difference is Internet easily connects users and owners. For owners, the sharing economy could mean the transformation of possession into revenue streams. Your own luxury handbag, your own luxury watches, your own luxury jewelry, why not? Why not renting these pieces if internet can easily connect you with potential people interested in using these objects. So for customers, obviously, uh, it provides potentially convenience, access without ownership at a fraction of the price. Another thing, when you talk about the sharing economy, is the social component of it. What is amazing is that the sharing economy is not only successful among people who have limited budget, limited um, purchasing power. Uh, the sharing economy can also be very popular among upper middle class or middle classes who have purchasing power, but they like, they like the social component of it. So interestingly, we could ask ourselves the question, could it be the next big disruptions that for certain rich people who own a lot of luxury goods, the next snobbish element will be why I should own all these objects, why I cannot just access them, just rent them. <laughs> this is a question I keep in my mind. Um, in fact, certain business models already exist. You have companies in the US like Rent the Runway, which developed efficiently, as you can see on this slide, as a fashion rental service company. And here the business model is very clear. They buy designer dress, designer handbags, and they rent these handbags to different consumers for a portion of the price. And then they wash it, it's being recycled, and other users can rent them. But we start to see some smart entrepreneurs creating some peer-to-peer -peer platforms. And I have seen this in New York with a concept like Village Lux, which is basically creating a social community online of upper middle class women who like to not only share between themselves their closet, but also develop a social network. So the sharing economy can also be valuable for rich people due to this social component. Behind the sharing economy, behind all these elements, my conviction is that probably the biggest disruption at the moment is the fact that luxury consumers are empowered. They are empowered because they are connected, because they are more knowledgeable, they are sometimes more knowledgeable than the brands themselves. So consumers' empowerment at the end of the day, thanks to digital, is probably one of the biggest threats or disruptions for luxury brands. Now, if we uh, want to understand how luxury brands can best leverage digital disruptions, we should quickly revisit some of the key elements that distinguish luxury brands from normal brands in terms of branding and distribution. I will be very fast on that, but I would like to remind you six or seven key elements that we need to keep in mind. What differentiates luxury brands from FMCG brands? First is that concept of uniqueness, which is very, very important, as obviously it has been the first challenge when thinking about Internet, how luxury brands can protect this uniqueness in a world which is very open by nature and very democratic by nature. So luxury brands definitely try to be not just different, they try to enhance their uniqueness. And we need to keep this in mind. How they do this? They do this by really understanding deeply 
what makes them unique. Different brands have different names for that. Most of the brands talk about DNA. The DNA is really the genetic code of the brand. This is really what makes the brand different, not just different, unique. And then the codes is something very useful for luxury brands to convey usually this uniqueness to translate these codes into visual clues such as logo, colors, packaging, even retail codes and retail footprint. Another extremely important element, everyone working in this industry knows what differentiates often luxury brands is the power of storytelling. A lot of brands tell stories, but luxury brands have this great, great know-how on how to enrich their storytelling by digging deeply into their history, into their heritage, but also sometimes using collaboration. But this storytelling should also reach the potential clients for whom it is created. So we will see that potentially digital content is, of course, a very interesting way for luxury brands to enrich their storytelling by incorporating the power of technology. Another key element for luxury brand, which is also one of the obstacles they faced initially with digital, is the fact that they need to protect a certain level of exclusivity, of rarity. A luxury product from a luxury brand, even if that brand is successful, people should find it not so easy to get, not so easy to reach. So obviously online, a lot of luxury brands felt it was very hard to maintain that exclusivity, considering the fact that internet at the beginning appeared as the most democratic, the most open channel. At the same time, Small and big luxury brands have here potentially opposite needs. It's interesting that the more the brand is famous, the more the brand is successful, the more it needs to re-enhance its exclusivity. However, a lot of luxury brands, smaller, niche, new luxury brands, are so exclusive that in fact they are not very successful because they lack popularity. That concept of popularity is often not very well understood. Popularity doesn't mean accessibility. What I mean by popularity is that the brand should not be easy to get, should not be accessible, but should be admired. So it should be popular in the eyes of a lot of consumers who will not buy it because they cannot afford. But when someone will buy this brand or will receive it as a gift, they will be proud because they will know a lot of people admire this brand. A lot of people know this brand. And here I insist on that concept because obviously internet, digital collaborations are going to be a way for a lot of luxury brands to develop popularity without necessarily becoming accessible in terms of entry price products. Another interesting feature of luxury brand management is how luxury brands value their heritage, their cultural foundations, but at the same time try to innovate on tradition, try to be true to their signature, to their DNA, at the same time stay relevant. And here, obviously, internet, the online world, is the new world in which a lot of the millennium, the new, the younger consumers of luxury brands want to live. They want to actually live between the offline and the online world. So to show to these consumers that they can innovate on tradition, we will see that digital can be actually something very interesting for these brands to leverage on modernity, to innovate on tradition. Another very interesting feature for luxury brands is retail. A lot of luxury brands in the past 20 years have invested a lot of money, a lot of efforts, a lot of energy on integrated retail, which at the beginning is potentially a contradiction with e-commerce. Why? 
it's easy to understand. Luxury brands are using uh, traditional brick and mortar stores not only as a sales channel, but also as a communication tool. They are basically investing a lot of money to communicate their DNA, their codes, to educate their consumers about what makes their brand unique through these beautiful flagship stores. But at the same time, these brick and mortar stores are also a barrier to new entrants. At all, what is interesting here is that at the beginning, obviously e-commerce was seen as a threat. When you think of it, it's not just e-commerce, even mobile commerce. What means mobile commerce? Mobile commerce means that anyone in the world, anywhere, anytime, from his smartphone, can potentially buy any product from any brand. The concept of mobile commerce means that the traditional concept of location, physical location, food traffic, which is the foundation of luxury brands' traditional retail investment, that concept is potentially fading away. You know, what means location? Online. We all understand the power of the location offline. Can you manage, control the traffic online in the same way you can do it offline? Obviously not. And I will develop on this later. So, having revisited these six principles, with, which is really what makes luxury brands a little bit different, a little bit unique, let's look at how luxury brands embraced the digital revolution. I don't think you would be surprised by my first statement. Luxury brands, as you can see on these slides, were obviously slow at embracing digital. And it's an euphemism to say that. Fifteen years ago, a lot of talented and smart people even thought that luxury brands should stay away from digital under most of its expressions. And I cannot totally blame them. The world is changing so fast that it was not obvious to figure out at the beginning how luxury brands should face these disruptions. Internet was seen, and it's absolutely normal, as a threat of differentiation, as a loss of control on their brand image. Because a lot of what is happening online is not something the brand can entirely control, as opposed to what's happening offline. Also, e-commerce initially was seen as something very much connected with counterfeit. A lot of e-commerce websites opened 15 years ago, selling replicas of the most famous luxury watches, timepieces. So, Understandingly, luxury brands didn't want to legitimate by opening this uh, e-commerce website the uh, business of these counterfeiters or even some uh, grey market, parallel market dealers. Also, I mentioned it already, e-commerce was seen as a threat for the investments that luxury brands made in traditional retail. If you think in terms of the amount of goodwill which is present in the balance sheet of a lot of luxury group linked with, you know, the, uh, the goodwill value of all these expensive luxury stores, obviously just the, the idea that one day e-commerce could threaten this importance and the value of luxury offline retail is obviously a, a, a big threat for a lot of luxury brands. It's interesting that until now, the price of luxury real estate, what we call prime real estate, the best street or the A malls, has always increased. Sometimes it stopped increasing during financial crisis, but globally, if you look at it over 50 years, the price of the best luxury real estate kept increasing. And a lot of luxury brands have invested on that belief. The fact that e-commerce could one day impact the valuation of their real estate investment is also a threat. 
The thing is also we see a lot of omni-retail actors starting to grow. The difficulty for luxury brand is when they do something, they want to be the best at doing it. In terms of introducing omni-retail, which I will develop later, obviously luxury brands cannot be first in class. A lot of mass retailers, a lot of big department stores will be more ahead. They have more to invest. This is something also which can be um, something luxury brands don't really like. Social media. Obviously, uh, you could not ignore that after a few years, all luxury brands, one after the other, started to invest, open pages, create content for the most popular social media platform in Asia, in Europe, in the West, in the East. But, however, there is still a fundamental limitation of what they are doing on social media platforms. They are developing great content. They are investing a lot of money in creating beautiful content, in posting that content, in creating beautiful videos, but they don't really like to develop a conversation. It's something that always striked me, uh, watching luxury brands as opposed to mass retail brands or even you know traditional fast-moving consumer goods brands on social media platforms, luxury brands do not often respond when uh, clients, when the individuals post comments, questions, criticism, but sometimes just very simple question. I will not name brands, but if you think about most luxury handbag brands, if on Facebook or on Instagram, a client asks the brand a question on its page, when is the new collection going to be available in your store in Singapore, in New York, in Paris? Most of the time, the brand will not answer. So this is something very interesting, which intrigued me a lot. And I tried to understand for what reason luxury brands were also slow in developing this conversation, especially on social media platforms. At the same time, what you can read on these uh, new slides is that by being too slow, luxury brands have obviously missed a number of potential advantages. Uh, they also misunderstood initially how much internet globally as a concept is changing the habits, the, the lifestyle of consumers and probably luxury consumers more than any kind of consumers. Luxury consumers are usually the most informed. They understand more than others the benefit they can get from being knowledgeable, informed, empowered by internet. Another very interesting concept that I would like to develop here and take one minute. Offline, luxury brands have been very successful in controlling the food traffic. Opening stores only in prime location forced luxury consumers to go physically to these locations and they could easily control the food traffic and they could impose, which most of them did in the past 20 years, their concept of monobrand store from concept store to flagship stores to maison, uh, some of them are now opening huge brand houses. But they kind of force consumers to shop under the brand's concept, which is a monobrand concept. Interestingly, online, I'm sure all of you have a certain experience of shopping online. The fun, the convenience, the attractivity of shopping online is that online you are shopping in open environments, which most of the time are either multi-brand environments, like very successful e-tellers, and growingly marketplaces. Think about it. What's interesting is online and offline are two realities which more and more will need to be combined because the consumers are those who are navigating between this online and offline world. And if 
online, consumers get used to buy in multi-brand environments of different kinds, I think at some point it will affect the way they will want to shop offline. Until now, there really was not much room for them to decide because except for a few department stores, except for a few interesting multi-brand retailers, most of the brands were imposing offline their monobrand concept. Online, I don't think it's going to work like this. Of course, they can open their e-commerce boutique. They can expect some consumers to make the effort to register to Burberry.com.cn for China, for instance. But at the same time, how many consumers will never do it? Because they have been educated to shop on open marketplaces and other huge e-tailers platforms. So that's something interesting. Another, another uh, disruptions that luxury brands were initially slow at accepting is the fact that traditional media print is losing momentum. So we are starting to see more and more luxury brands switching part of their budget from traditional print media to digital media. And I think this is just the beginning of it. The challenge and what luxury brands have potentially missed, as it's written here, is that if you really want to engage online with your consumers on social media platform, delivering your brand content is of course very important, but it's not enough. And as we have seen before, for the moment, luxury brands put a lot of restrictions on creating a real dialogue. It was more a monologue. Last but not least, I do a lot of research on retail. I, I still believe, of course, don't take me wrong, on the importance of integrated retail and of offline retail. No one ever said that online will replace offline. However, what is interesting is that luxury brands in the past 20 years have invested a lot of money, a lot of money in improving the soft and hard components of offline retail. What I mean by this is they have created beautiful store, hiring the best architect, translating their DNA and their codes into retail architecture, decoration, furniture, beautiful product merchandising. At the same time, they have improved luxury service, developing the selling ceremony. What they forgot most of the time is something that internet is bringing back on the table in a very obvious way, convenience. What internet is often all about, what e-commerce is often all about is convenience. Luxury stores need to reconsider the importance they gave to convenience. Most of the time, you want to shop in a luxury store. Can you find out before making the effort to go to that store if the favorite product you have in mind is available in your size in that store? Most of the time, it's impossible. You cannot be informed. You don't get the convenience of questioning the store before in order to make sure that your visit will not result in a failure just because the product you want is out of stock or is not at that store that particular day. So convenience is really going to be the next big thing for luxury retailers. In fact, luxury retail, most of the time when I deliver trainings on luxury retail, I remind my audience it's about pleasure, it's about emotions. So of course, offline, there is a lot you can do to convey emotions through the attitude, the engagement, the sales associate, the brand ambassadors can have in the store with the consumer. However, we should not be mistaken. For a lot of consumers who value con convenience, but also have different sources of pleasure, 
buying online, buying online from the comfort of your sofa, uh, late in the evening, early in the morning, with your husband, your wife, scrolling down pages on your iPad or your smartphone, and looking at what's new today in that e-tailers uh, boutique online can also be a source of inspiration, can also be a source of pleasure. So this is also something luxury brands forgot. The pleasure of buying online is another form of pleasure, and you should let consumers decide where they get most pleasure. Let me now uh, introduce probably the, the most important concept. It's a new concept. I think the word omni-retail, which you can see on this slide with a, a small graph, is something totally new. What means omni-retail? It means not much, in fact. It means omnipresent. Uh, the reality that a lot of retail analysts have observed is that more and more buyers, so consumers, including luxury consumers, they are starting to engage with their favorite brands offline, of course, still a lot in traditional offline store, but also online, also on their smartphone, also on their iPad, also on their laptop also on their favorite social media platforms. And potentially in the future, through the IoT, they will be scanning more and more QR codes, or they will be scanning QR codes on traditional uh, digital uh, media display. And what this consumer is expecting more and more is the brand to facilitate, to create a seamless connection across all these channels. So what these analysts are, are predicting is that brands who will resist all these digital disruptions in the future will be brands that will be able to create a seamless connection between channels. They are brands that potentially, progressively, will be present offline, online, through a number of social media platforms, integrating technology, QR codes, but most importantly, we create a seamless connection across these channels so that the customer can seamlessly navigate between these channels. Obviously, for luxury brands, which are still, for many of them, learning how to become strong retailers, this is coming a little bit early, and this is something very hard to achieve. Actually, as you can see on this new slide, the world of omnichannel is a world of reorganizations, is a world where you need to invest a lot in revisiting your supply chain, your inventory management, but also your service procedures, and even your remuneration systems. Traditionally, sales associate for many brands are commissioned on sales. Teams are remunerated based on the objectives and the fact that their store will reach this objective. When you start to think about omni-retail, when you realize that in the future, the client will be able to maybe first inquire online then in the store, offline, touch the product, engage with the sales associate, and potentially will decide to buy, to transact later on, either offline, online, through his smartphone. The question that comes up is, who gets the sales? You know, which budget is going to be affected by this transaction? Because more and more, what internet means for empowered consumers is that they will be navigating at their convenience between offline and online channels at their convenience. Both will remain very important. Probably offline channel, particularly important for luxury purchases. But at the same time, transacting. What means transacting? It means deciding to take your credit card, pay now, and carry the product out of the store. I know for a number of luxury brands, they still view the fact that the transaction is taking place in the store as part as of the overall shopping experience. However, this is their view. This is their point of view. 
what I would like to defend here today is the point of view of a lot of consumers who don't necessarily agree with this and their pleasure will be about deciding when and when they want to transact for their convenience. So the fact that luxury uh, products may not be, an, I mean, the whole cycle of the luxury purchase up to the transaction may not take place in the same store. That is obviously something that will force luxury brands to revisit their whole compensation, remuneration, incentives, systems. In fact, uh, it's really about removing the silos. At the moment, you know, even the brands which are dynamic in developing a presence online, in developing digital marketing campaigns, find it very difficult to integrate the offline world, their stores, their sales associate. And you even have a kind of disruptions that, you know, when you go to the store, talking about a digital campaign, showing a QR code you have taken somewhere with your smartphone, the staff in the store, the brand in the offline world is not part of this digital communication. They are not aware, they are not involved. This will require a lot of reorganizations in the future. I call it removing the silos. And this will involve all the challenges I talked about regarding remuneration system, supply chain, inventory management, etc., etc. You know, today you've got these different ways of purchasing. Maybe you heard these two expressions, web rooming or showrooming. In fact, these are just words, but the reality behind it is really something that shows that the customer will decide. Web rooming means ba basically you are researching online before going offline. And a showrooming is you are researching offline and potentially you will transact online. Depending the product, depending the occasion, depending the client, the, 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 the preference could be more on the showrooming or the web rooming. And luxury brands in the future will need to be prepared to offer a similar path for the showroomers and the web roomers. So a lot of things can be said about digital and omni retail. I would like to move on a little bit now to share with you a little bit the current situation of e-commerce in the luxury industry. Obviously, a lot of reports are talking about this, um, the state of luxury e-commerce. I will only show you here a report which is already uh, more than one year old, uh, which was a report from um, the uh, McKinsey, which showed two interesting things. They were looking at the personal luxury market. And basically what they were saying here is that around 6% only of the luxury goods were bought online in 2014 for this personal luxury market. However, what they showed in this study is that 75% of the offline purchases were influenced by what luxury brands had been doing online. So this just reminds you of something fundamental. The big mistake is to oppose online and offline as if it was a competition. Who will win? This no one knows. Consumers will decide. What's for sure is the winners will be those who will create a seamless platform that will make it easy for their consumers to navigate between online and offline touch points. What is interesting uh, behind this report, and I, and I will not develop it here, you can easily download it, is that behind, again, the concept of e-commerce versus offline, online versus offline, it's more about touch points. What the digital revolution has created, and these luxury brands should look at it as an opportunity is a huge number of new online touch points. I would like to show you a slide which is a little bit heavy, but just to illustrate that point. On the top side, you've got all the traditional offline touch points, which have always existed. And for most of them, which are still 
very, very relevant. And we are seeing here how these different offline touch points can be very important for the consumer awareness, discovery, interest, evaluation until the transaction and until loyalty and long-time engagement. At the same time, what you are seeing in the bottom part of this slide is that there's probably as many, if not more, online touch points. And these online touch points have imposed themselves as critical touch points, not totally replacing the traditional offline touch points, more complementing them. Uh, and the real interesting question that all luxury brands should ask themselves, what is my consumer journey? What is my consumer journey among offline and online touch points? What are the most critical online and offline touch points for my consumer or for different groups of consumer? As a, a, a very small example, I would like to share with you on this slide the case which was uh, related to me by one of my students on a Japanese consumer, female consumer, who discovered a brand, a beauty brand called Kills from uh, L'Oreal and engaged with this brand progressively online and offline. And her journey, her specific journey with that brand initially started on a line, which is, you know, a Japan, a Korean, Thai social media platform where she saw some uh, posts of her friends talking about Kills. That was the first touch point. Then she was commuting every day between Tokyo, city center and suburbs. And near, near the train station, she saw a small traditional offline kill store. And to the store, decided, talked with a sales associate, got some samples, a brochure, even a brochure, the old fashioned brochure, came back home. Before going to bed, she had the idea to look again at the brochure. She found it inspiring. She found it inspiring. She made a last attempt to check customer reviews on Kills on um, her favorite um, review site, which happened to be uh, Cosme. On Cosme, she found great reviews. So finally, she decided to go to the Kills website, found it quite user-friendly, registered online, and placed her first order. So here, in that particular example, if I show it visually, this consumer went from discovery, awareness, to engagement, even loyalty, because she registered in the Kills database through eight touch points. And interestingly, we have almost as many offline touch points as we have online touch points. So just this to show you that luxury brands should actually see all these new digital online touch points as an opportunity. An opportunity to have more ways to engage with different groups of consumers. In addition, of course, to the offline touch points, which for most of them remain extremely relevant. Uh, let me now share with you a few trends. Uh, despite the fact that um, McKinsey showed that only 6% of luxury goods are being purchased online, obviously that part is growing much faster than offline uh, transactions. So what we're seeing now is luxury brands in all markets progressively opening their own e-commerce stores. And they are doing it initially, most of the time in America, in England, which is one of the countries where e-commerce is the most developed, then in the rest of Europe, then in Asia, nowadays growingly also in China. At the same time, what we're seeing is the traditional partners of luxury brands, the big retailers, the department stores also investing a lot of money and resources in developing their e-commerce website, which are more obviously e-tailers. And at the same time, we have a lot, really a lot of new creative 
e-tellers concept developing around beauty, around fashion, around jewelry. Some of them are direct sales, some of them are marketplaces, and all these new concepts are obviously offering to luxury consumers a growing variety of channels where they can, if they want, engage with luxury or premium brands online, not only, of course, on the brand's website. Interestingly, another trend is to see nowadays a lot of the most successful e-tellers in beauty, even Amazon, we saw it, starting to go offline. And that's, again, a, a reminder that the future is not about opposing online and offline. And all the strongest online concept, they know that if they are successful, they are starting now to go offline in order to develop maybe faster than others an omni-channel uh, environment for their consumers.